Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for the April 2021 session of Brinex Community Live, which is themed and featured around artificial intelligence applications in GI. Uh, we have some very special speakers today, uh, but for those who have not attended the Brinex Community Live session or don't know about Brinex Community, I just want to give some background to this group. Uh, this was started uh, two plus years ago with the idea of machine learning in healthcare for good so that we can have a community that can collaborate, that can share scientific uh, material and educational material, uh, have foster collaborative opportunities, which has grown to be a 3,000 plus member international group. A uh, couple of web pages uh, that we have, the brainxai.org or brainxcommunity.com. We have a very active LinkedIn group where there are 1800 plus members share a lot of articles, share a lot of meeting opportunities and information uh, over there. And we have our monthly live sessions over here. And uh, interestingly, we went to Zoom uh, even before COVID had hit us because there was a great demand from the international community that they, they wanted to, to join. And this, is a, this helped us tremendously. Uh, this is the web page, three different sections primarily over there, the connect one, uh, the data and loan. The connect essentially features uh, these meetings that we have been holding. Uh, you can get information about it. You can get information about uh, the, the past meetings uh, that have been held. The YouTube videos uh, that are recorded are uh, linked over there. So a lot of information that is there about our past live sessions. Uh, as I mentioned, we have our own YouTube channel where you can go and uh, subscribe us so that you can get uh, the information about latest video uh, that has been posted. Uh, and as I mentioned, a very active LinkedIn group uh, also called BrainX Community, uh, which you can join. There is a loan section which highlights a lot of publications from different groups. It's uh, annotated. Uh, based on the speciality that that publication represents. Uh, it's linked directly to either the journal or uh, some other uh, location where from where you can access the article itself. And said so, like it's annotated or categorized based on the different specialities that it represents. There is also a data section. This is uh, one of the largest uh, repositories for open source data sets uh, for AI and healthcare. And uh, once you go there, you'll find links to all these open source data sets that will help fulfill your needs. These data sets also are annotated. Uh, so you can find the different data sets that might be of interest to you for your specialty so that you can build your interesting models out of that. Uh, and of course, COVID-19 has uh, been an important part of our life for the last year or so. So there are COVID-19 data sets that are available there too. Uh, we expanded uh, the year prior to, to Europe and we had a very successful session and we're looking forward to having it more. So we are not just based out of US, it's an international community. A lot of journals have focused on machine learning and, and AI in healthcare. And those journals are listed uh, on our website. Uh, there are direct links so that you can go there and see what's the latest and the greatest in, in the scientific knowledge and breakthroughs. And our community has also fostered transcontinental collaboration, working with uh, different members. Here we worked with Dr. Tav Pritesh Sethi out in India. He's uh, uh, at, at a triple IT, and uh, we have been able to get some research work done and fostered this some of this collaboration. Here's an example of that. And recently, uh, earlier this year, we launched launched our podcast series. Thanks to Alok Kothari and Dr. Ashish Khanna. Uh, again, uh, you can go to the website or you can go to any of the, the podcast uh, channels that you subscribe to. You can subscribe us and there are some great uh, conversations that you can listen to through our, our podcast series, all with the goal of fostering collaboration and sharing knowledge. Earlier this year, uh, just like the prior years, we published the 2020 year in review. Uh, you can go and download it freely. It's uh, open access uh, from our website or through ResearchGate. And uh, we have Dr. Gursimran Kocher, who was uh, one of the, the co-authors for us, who talked about uh, gastroenterology. And it's, 
in this particular publication, you can see between 2018 and 2020, the number of publications ha has been expanding at a very rapid pace. So GI, although less so than some of the other specialities, is truly inching up and, and catching up with a great amount of research and publications. Uh, that has the specialist abstract from Dr. Uh, Gursimran Kocher, who's gonna moderate this session. Uh, we looked at 81 pub publications. A lot of those were endoscopy related and then six RC RCT, so you can tell us more about that. Once again, uh, different areas, different venues, uh, select your best and favorite medium to get engaged and to get information. And we are happy to, to, to support this effort. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Gursimran Kocher. Uh, who is the Associate Divin Chief of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. Uh, he's also the Medical Director of Endoscopic Innovations at Allegheny Health Network. And recently he has been very, very uh, engaged with all the AI research there. Uh, and I've learned that he is very integrated in certain leadership roles over there. Uh, of course, he trained at Cleveland Clinic previously, a good friend. And with that, I'm gonna to transition to, to Dr. Kocher. Uh, thank you so much, Piyush. Uh, thank you so much. I think BrainX has truly been a fantastic platform, um, and and I I just loved it. Uh, you know the the amount I have been part for this. So not taking too much time, I think we'll dive straight into our speakers. Um, I want to request Dr. Sharma. Uh, you know, Dr. Sharma does not need any introduction. Uh, you know, uh, you know my 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 mentor always told me that you know there are certain people whose CV speaks more than their name. And Dr. Sharma has been phenomenal. Uh, every month you pick up any GI journal, they, he has to have a manuscript in there. Uh, he's been a leader in the field of Barrett's esophagus, uh, but now he's also a leader in the field of artificial intelligence. So without any further ado, Dr. Sharma, I'm going to hand it over to you. He's going to talk to us about AI and polyp detection and future of colonoscopy. Okay, Simran, uh, thank you very much and uh, good evening to everyone. And uh, Piyush and Simran, thanks for taking the lead on uh, BrainX and uh, getting this uh, community going. Uh, you can see, just as you mentioned correctly, with the number of publications, there's a great interest uh, in this field. So my congratulations to uh, both of you on taking and spearheading uh, this. Uh, so I'll, I'll be just focusing on uh, colonoscopy per se, but uh, uh, just as a background of why we are all interested in uh, artificial intelligence and why is it making a splash now when this was first, you know, invented, so as to say, in the 1950s, why is this interest right here? And if you look at where it can impact in healthcare, which is a huge expenditure for our GDP and for our country, is several fold, whether on the clinical side, it goes from imaging to precision medicine. Sometimes what we forget is also the impact that it can have on the administrative side. And we did hear that Simran starting some, you know, research into this about building some platforms on scheduling. But I mean, I think that's a whole wide area as well, which will help us focus on the clinical aspect rather than spending time uh, related to non-clinical things or mundane things uh, which are related there. So this potential is not true for gastroenterology, but for, I think, medicine and AI in general, and specifically for procedures, if you're doing repetitive tasks, which are finding polyps, finding you know, lesions within the lumen of the GI Ta uh, of the GI tract, then obviously anything that can help us or assist us in diagnosing and detecting this would be useful. And so that's where it comes into play in terms of computer vision. We can, of course, expand access to services as well. Uh, for example, if you build these machine learning algorithms within a capsule, which is uh, going through the GI tract and looking at images. I mean, that can help expand services. And of course, a consistent diagnosis for our patients uh, is key. And that's where all of this plays into role. So if you look at image recognition specifically, and that's the focus for the next uh, part of my presentation, 
is within the colon or colonoscopy, when we are examining the lining of the colonic mucosa, we are trying to recognize polyps. And you can see an example on the left. Once we recognize a polyp, we need to further characterize that because polyps can be precancerous, but they can be benign as well in terms of without any cancerous potential. And so those could potentially be ignored rather than taking multiple biopsies or removal of that area. And then within the polyp or a flat area, you could look at abnormal areas. If you diagnose a cancer, you could be able to predict the depth of that cancer real time rather than waiting for the diagnosis to happen. So those are all potential areas where AI can be applied to the field of colonoscopy, specifically colon polyps and colon cancer. So this is the use case that we use for this uh, part of the talk, which is that you're looking at uh, you know, colonoscopy images, colonoscopy videos. When you go to polyps and cancer, you're using histology as the ground truth. And then it is developing or undergoing several iterations and it gives you the algorithm, which then you can try to use in clinical practice. And so this is how, at least for colonoscopy, it would work. So let's look at several aspects of uh, colonoscopy and uh, see how uh, AI could be of assistance in each one of these. The first is the bowel prep assessment. And by that we mean is that prior to performing a colonoscopy, all the patients undergo a preparation to clean or cleanse their bowels so that when you look inside, you're actually able to see the lining of the mucosa and uh, look for the lesions or the polyps. The second is cecal intubation, which means that you've reached the end of the colon. So that's the final goal that we want to achieve is reach the end where it joins the small intestine and then we start coming back. And the third is the coming back part, which is the withdrawal time. And the withdrawal time has been shown that if you do a very quick withdrawal, you may be able to miss lesions. And that's why those are the important things that you may look into. So how can AI help us in this? And there are several ways of doing this. This is real-time assessment of the bowel preparation. So the way we look at bowel prep or assess it is by using a validated score, which is called the Boston bowel prep score, which at the bottom of the left-hand side, you have a score from zero to three, with zero being worst and three being the best. And so this is one of our quality metrics that we look at during colonoscopy. And you can see that rather than the physician trying to focus on the bowel prep and grade it in the report, you could have this automated. And you can see on the left-hand side of the screen that as the withdrawal is happening, depending on the bowel prep, the computer is grading it as whether it's one, whether it's two, or whether it's three, and what percentage of the bowel wall is related to each one of those. And I think that's how it would be helpful. So for this part, what they did is they looked at, you know, several uh, training and validation images and applied a CNN-based algorithm. And this is the accuracy of the machine compared to either novice endoscopists or senior endoscopists or experts. And you can see that for a repetitive task like this or a mundane task like this, the machine outperforms humans or even expert endoscopists in order to do that. The second is whether you've reached the end or not. How do you need, uh, know that? And we usually do that by looking at the landmarks. And for example, the landmark we use is the appendicial orifice shown in the center of the image right here. And we know that this is the landmark and right above that is the ileocecal valve or the area where the small bowel joins the colon. And so this landmark can also be automated and can be recognized by the machine. And it tells you, okay, you've reached the end. Now you can start your withdrawal time. Now the withdrawal has, as I told you earlier, has to be relatively slow so that you're not just zipping through areas, but actually spending some time in recognizing some of the areas within the colon in order to do that. And this can be monitored also by, you know, another person in the room, which is the computer. 
who are looking at you and providing you with assistance. If you're withdrawing too fast, the arrow can go into the red area, which tells you that you probably need to slow down a little. Whereas if it's in the green zone on the speedometer, it tells you that you're probably doing a reasonably good job in looking at the mucosa with a good withdrawal time. So next comes to the detection of these polyps, uh, which we do real time during colonoscopy. And this is done by the appearance of these bounding boxes uh, that you can see around the polyp. So this is what as endoscopists we try to find during a procedure. Now this is a precancerous area which needs to be resected, removed and sent out because it's been shown that if you do this, there is indirect evidence that this reduces the incidence of colon cancer by doing that. And this is one of the goals of colonoscopy as we do it. Now we did hear earlier from Piyush about Simran's work at looking at the publications in GI. And so we do have randomized control trials available. And this was one of the first ones from Asia, which randomize patients to either a colonoscopy with or without a CAD-E device. And the outcome was to look as to how many adenomas or precancerous lesions are detected. And you can see the input as well as the output, how this device worked. And this was the primary aim of the study. The ADR stands for adenoma detection rate which me is a measure of the detection of these precancerous polyps. And you can see that the CAD -E version or the arm was significantly superior as compared to the non CAD E arm in terms of detection of these lesions. Now the next RCT was from uh, Europe and they also randomized patients again to a CAD -E versus a non CAD E arm and they looked at a screening and a surveillance population with similar outcomes of looking at an ADR, which by the way also is one of our metrics that we use uh, during endoscopy to tell us how good or bad uh, endoscopist is and that they should have a preset or predefined adenoma detection rate in their practice. And you can see the results again showing a significant you know, benefit in terms of the machine, in terms of detecting more lesions as that's happening. So because of several such uh, RCTs being published with more than 4,000 patients, this a few months ago, there was a systematic review and meta-analysis published of comparing these different RCTs. ADR is the adenoma detection rate, which is what we are interested in. PDR is the polyp detection rate, which means any lesion that was diagnosed, which could or could not have been a precancerous lesion. And you can again see the advantage for AI for increasing the detection of both polyps as well as adenomas uh, during a colonoscopy. Now, one of the downsides sometimes can be the false positives that the machine is trying to alert you to too many lesions uh, or areas within the colon wall, which may lead to uh, 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 an increase in the colonoscopy time. And so this would be something as an important measure to look at. And this paper looked at you know, what these measures were, and they identified about a thousand false positives identified by the CAD-E device. And they looked at why were the machine alerting the endoscopist to an abnormal area. And what they found was that the majority of the time it was not due to something within the uh, wall of, or, or the lumen of the colon, but it was related to the bowel wall, meaning that it is a fold may be realized as being something abnormal. And then they went deeper to look at the time which was spent and you can see that for the majority of the false positives, less than three seconds were spent to evaluate that area, whereas it was only in the minority or 20% that more than three seconds were required by the endoscopist to look at it and say that, well, huh, this is a, true, is a true false positive and that we just need to move away from it and not pay attention to it. The second issue comes to characterization and that is 
you know, looking at a polyp, which is shown right in the center of the screen right here. And then for the machine to predict with a certain degree of probability, what type of polyp it is. So here the machine is predicting with 95 to 100% certainty that this is a type two polyp, which according to our classification means that it is uh, something which probably is a tubular adenoma and should be removed and is a precancerous polyp that should be resected. And so if you look at how uh, you know, this CAD-X device performs for it. You can see the uh, sensitivity and the negative predictive value for real-time characterization of these polyps, which are built into uh, some of the devices which are coming up. This is still not FDA approved. I have to tell you that the CAD-E device, or at least the first one got FDA approved, literally, I think about two weeks ago. And so that was an, is an exciting time for gastroenterology because now I think with that first one having a de novo uh, approval, it just opens the way for subsequent uh, you know, machines and devices to be approved and available for us as clinicians to do that. This is again a similar example of another device which is analyzing it and it is calling it that this is, a, after it looks at it, that this is an adenoma. And then you can see on the right that it's looking at a similar lesion like that it starts analyzing it and then it starts telling you what its predicted histology is. And in this situation, after looking at it, it sort of recognizes this as being a hyperplastic or an, as a non-adenomatous tissue. And that's the characterization part of uh, looking at these CAD -E device, X devices in it. Taking a step further is if you do see a cancer within the lumen of the colon wall, uh, you know, can you also predict how deep it's going within the colon wall? Because only if it's superficial do we resect it. If it's deep invasion into the muscle layer, that needs to be sent for surgery. And again, we are starting to see just um, one month ago, this was published in one of our endoscopy journals in which, again, they looked at a test set of more than 7,000 images and then looked at non-magnified white light imaging as well. And then what they were able to do is predict, you know, the sensitivity specificity of being either non-invasive or superficially uh, invasive cancer, i.e. something which would make our lives better by saying that this is a lesion which may be resectable during the procedure as to why we are doing that. So where do we stand and where do we go from here? I mean, the first thing is that what we are trying to do within GI is just look at it. And, uh, you know, it, it's good for the GI community to learn uh, from other uh, uh, specialties uh, which are ahead of the game, such as uh, whether it's radiology, uh, whether it's other data scientists who've been doing this in collaboration with either breast oncologists or even pathology. And, and while you're evaluating these papers or these reports, I think these are the questions that you should be asking yourself. And so looking at what performance metrics are being looked at, what's the gold standard, what's the ground truth that's being used, has external validation been done or not? So things like that, I think, need to be answered, not just by societies and regulatory bodies, but I think all of us need to be educated in this aspect. Uh, you know, in order to uh, look at all of these things as well. And then, of course, these are also sort of like general limitations of uh, AI in general have been addressed in other fields. I think GI is just on the brink or the cusp of a number of these things. We do have RCTs finally. And, uh, you know, some of these points that I've mentioned still need to be uh, you know, reported in different disease states. And I think, uh, you know, will be looked at critically as time moves on to do that. So again, I mean, this is where we stand for AI in uh, colonoscopy is that what I have uh, talked about is just enhancing the diagnosis, what, which is one, you know, part of the piece of the puzzle. The other is, uh, you know, on the side of, uh, the data part or big data, which is to gather information and then provide it to the clinician in a meaningful way. And then that will help us in establishing better treatment plans. So I think all of this is a big happy marriage that needs to happen 
in order for us to uh, improve uh, patient outcomes. So again, I'll stop right there, guys. Again, Piyush and uh, Simran, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to this uh, wonderful uh, uh, platform. And, uh, you know, maybe we can open it up or uh, uh, yeah. Simran, it's you again. Thanks. Yes. No, thank you so much, Dr. Sharma. So normally at the end of all three talks, we'll take questions. Participants will keep writing in the chat. Uh, at this point, we'll move on to the uh, you know, next uh, presentation here. And next uh, up, I'd like to call Karen. Uh, Karen is a former colleague. She's a she was a, a lead data scientist with us at uh, Highmark. Uh, she recently uh, switched roles and now she is a senior director of data science management at Johnson & Johnson. Um, and, you know, Karen primarily will be uh, talking to us, uh, you know, in regards to building these algorithms, you know, from the physician side of things, we are always very curious as to what does a data scientist want from us. So uh, we'll hand it over to Karen. Uh, Karen, uh, you're up. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks for having me. Um, let me first see if I can. Uh... Perfect. Perfect. Okay, there we go. Excellent. Um, switching between computers. And as uh, Simran mentioned, I'm now um, actually in a new job. So I'm on my, my third one in a short amount of time. So my name is Kern Katz. I uh, was formerly, in, uh, I think in the intro, the Director for Data Science R&D at Highmark Health. And I'll uh, just talk a little bit about that and then a bit about my background in general, because I think it's data scientists come from a lot of different backgrounds and that probably impacts the best way to work with that particular data scientist. And um, I, I can speak about mine and, and ones I've seen in others and happy to answer questions about backgrounds, uh, you know, what works in what situation and would love to hear what, what you've observed and uh, kind of the ideal data scientist to work with if you work with them. So as the director of data science R&D at Highmark Health, I got to see a broad range of problems in healthcare. For those of you who don't know, Highmark Health is an integrated payer provider system. And so it's a large Blue Cross Blue Shield insurer. And then also um, there's Allegheny Health Network, so a provider system. And then a few other lines of business in healthcare, um, reinsurance, dental insurance, um, probably missing a few there, a platform for other uh, blues plans to use for claims processing. So working at Highmark Health, the parent company for uh, a data scientist, it's really a really broad view into everything from care management um, at the health plan side, uh, formulary optimization, how you know the, the plan, health plan makes decisions to obviously the, the clinical side at Allegheny Health Network, which is a newer area and one of the, the really exciting ones that I got um, to, to work on over, over my years there. I did start as a data scientist at Highmark for a year or so. So I was building models. One of the first ones I, I built when I got there was one predicting high cost claimants for the health plan. And it was very general. And this is, you know, my background, which I'll go into as a, as a scientist, a cognitive neuroscientist by training. And so when I got to this business setting, the questions were really, really broad, but that is actually a, at times a very good match um, for machine learning and artificial intelligence methods. But this high cost claimants prediction was not specific. Um, which is interesting talking right to specialists, but it was across a ton of um, different conditions and situations and it looked at a lot of different variables. And so that's one of the interesting things that data scientists sometimes do. And we work together, you know, just to, to think about. Um, so I, I, I was at Highmark until very recently, actually. I, I just started a new position, um, Senior Director of Data Science uh, Portfolio Management at um, Janssen R&D, so at Johnson & Johnson. But this is literally my second week. So what I'm going to discuss today is much more influenced by my previous experience and um, experience, uh, especially at Highmark Health. but also worked at Beth Israel Medical Center, um, doing neuroimaging and then the biological psychiatry area. Um, early 2000s, I've worked uh, 
more research studies, Harvard uh, Developmental Studies Lab, at Humboldt University, where I did my PhD, um, and quite a few settings, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, where I did a postdoc before joining Highmark. And so my journey was an academic one. However, in my PhD, I was working with fMRI data, which is large, um, well, I thought at the time complex data, although once I got to Highmark and looked at insurance claims, the brain was like very simple, it seemed. Um, but it, it was data as a scientist, and sometimes you might see as a data, sci a data scientist who came from a scientific background, um, we're used to, and, and you as scientists and researchers are sometimes used to being able to control the generation of your data and control the experiment. And then in a lot of settings that I've worked in, we have data that has been described as exhaust. Like it's just sort of the leftover stuff of the business of healthcare, whether that's an EHR that really wasn't designed to, to carefully gather data for data science and sometimes can be a bit uh, messy or definitely insurance claims data, which were not designed for data scientists either. And so that messiness is, is something that um, you'll see, I would say a scientist coming into data science and frankly, uh, clinicians we work with who are scientists, right? Um, kind of struck by when they start. I think those are the relevant parts of a uh, background, but I was fortunate to both understand the biological sort of neural network that drives a lot of the methods in um, artificial intelligence, which was very helpful. And then also just have experience doing machine learning on a variety of data, fMRI data, um, more structured data that we collected, and then also experimental design and just thinking in that way, I think is a helpful skill. You don't always get to do that. And sometimes we work differently, but I think it's a, it's a helpful skill that um, you, with a certain type of data scientist, you might get to work with someone who thinks more like that. And I found physicians also have that training and skill. So I'm going to start with what is data science? And I think for this group, it's probably a very basic thing that you already know. So I'm going to say what is data science from the perspective of most data scientists. And this is not universal but I think it's helpful to know and not always obvious. Data is in the name, but really data scientists focus on uh, predicting, optimizing, you know, suggesting things like next best action um, and what's sometimes called uh, prescriptive analytics. So both predicting what might happen next, but then suggesting what the next best action might be and that sort of uh, decision support role. And in most cases, when working with physicians, in many cases, obviously, it's a it's a it's a tool to just to help, right? It doesn't uh, make the diagnosis with no further intervention or, you know, make a, a choice in some cases, though, you know, it may that's a different category. But I do think that next best action is an interesting part of um, AI that we're just now kind of getting to, but it could help the workflow. And just terms that you know you hear, but supervised and unsupervised learning. So supervised learning being the you know predicting something with a known uh, label or outcome. So you know whether you know this person actually uh, developed the disease you're trying to predict, for example versus um, unsupervised learning, which can be very useful in situations where you don't know that but you want to create, um, understand the underlying like groupings of patients, maybe like subtypes and phenotypes within data that you have, but you may not know, know or have an outcome. That unsupervised methods, very familiar to marketing. So you'll see these like creative personas that are written um, in descriptions of maybe a customer and different types of customers, but this can also be used with patients. And the big thing with both of these that um, physicians who are experts in artificial intelligence know, but sometimes this is a point of confusion, is that the uh, algorithms here are kind of creating the rules. And sometimes, you know, you could think of that as the scoring code they generate. And that 
can be combined with, and I believe frequently is useful to combine with what you might call a rules-based system. So layering on some constraints there. Um, so you might know that there's some prediction that's just not possible, or you would never want to make under a, in a certain situation. When we're talking, I've done some work with the sepsis prediction and, and we got feedback that, you know, we don't need like alerts routed for, um, patients that are already in the ICU, like we know these, these are high sepsis risks, like those alerts are just kind of crowding out the rest. Sometimes that's an issue of training the algorithm. Other times that's an issue of, you know what, maybe we just need some rules layered on top of the AI to make it useful. There are, and this is not, sometimes data scientists will be um, like AI is the ultimate form and you know others are not, they're all advanced analytic methods, right? I would say outside of AI, you you frequently want an insight more than you want like a tool that's going to make future predictions and run in like a, a work a clinical workflow. Um, but that's a frequent point of confusion, and sometimes you really you just you need an insight or you need more traditional statistics hypothesis testing. And that um, is a different exercise. It's not meant for an individual level prediction. It's crucial and it doesn't, one cannot replace the other. And there are related techniques and methods between the two. But I think understanding that difference is uh, going to be one of the biggest uh, ways to optimize the communication and the productivity between data scientists and physicians. And then things like descriptive analytics, diagnostic analytics, or other terms that more, out, I would say, outside of a scientific setting, but you know, are used, um, just visualizations and dashboards. We, as data scientists, at times, will need to do this early and work with you on this to just understand the data and make a quick decision on feasibility or data quality. But frequently, if this is the endpoint, the typical data scientist would not, it wouldn't be the right role. And um, unfortunately, I, I think we need more people to, to be involved in data and analytics and help physicians because you need to see patients and do research, you know, not be pulling data. And um, I know data scientists frequently, we, we would feel terrible when we'd have to ruthlessly prioritize and say, this is, you know, just a descriptive, question, um, because it can be, even if that's the end step, it can be so important. Um, but it's a role I, I think we need to, to find more people really skilled in that role, because it's not easy, and um, fill that gap. And then the just the final thing, going back to those rules, other methods may use the rules up front. You may have a decision flow that experts write the, you know, if then statements, so to speak. And that is frequently valid and frequently valid to layer with an AI driven um, rules set, but um, it's, it's a bit of a different, a different thing. And the great thing about AI is you don't need to know upfront how you wanna use the data or even if the data is, is useful. That's a, that's a good thing. So I wanna switch quickly to options for building AI, because this group, I think is, in, from what I've seen, the, the community, much more advanced than usual. And you probably have, in this group, physicians who either have within their department or their, their research group or the ability to, you know, have people build AI or they can build AI. And some physicians certainly have the time and interest to learn and do it yourself those are two ways to do it. And it's probably in your, in um, this community a little more likely, but I'm going to assume that most, um, most physicians maybe don't, I don't have time to go learn to, to develop AI or just are not as interested in doing that, but that is an option. I'm going to call it the do it yourself as a physician, learn to code, um, you know, your, kind of using Jupyter Notebooks or Python, open source tools usually, SKLearn, TensorFlow, those are some of the tools you'll hear about. But I would say this is 
not because of the algorithm development or even the code. This is one of the harder options unless you have access to a really developed system. And this is really what you know what you want to do and you do. If you don't have access to other people, which are these kind of last two options, there are tools out there that are um, low code or auto ML type tools. And if you understand AI, it's a good option. Um, you might be able to, you still need good data. You need the right problem, which I'll talk about next, but it may help you do a little bit more yourself or find someone who's maybe not a data scientist quite yet, um, but maybe uh, earlier in their career, it'll make it a little easier for them before they develop really deep skills. In most cases, I would say the ideal or what's really likely to produce um, AI that is a, I'm gonna say a product, something that can be operationalized, impact outcomes and be used on a, on a wide scale. Um, you're gonna to wanna to either work with a data scientist and usually this is one or two, but frequently one data scientist, um, or ideally, if you're at an organization that has very developed infrastructure and resources, a cross-functional team. So this would be a team of data scientists and data engineers and ML engineers who specialize in operationalizing the algorithms that are developed. Um, you'd also have application developers and people with expertise in like user interface or integration into Epic. It would be a whole like cross team effort. And that is a great thing to have. It usually implies you have a very sophisticated organization and infrastructure to work with. Um, but if you can take advantage of that. Overall, the big advice I have and I follow this myself is build it the easiest way you can because the challenge is in adoption. Um, we find we spend most of our time and energy really focusing on change management skills and like work communicating, talking to clinicians, understanding the workflow, understanding who's going to use this tool and how, how it's going to interface with systems. Are people ready to um, and do they understand what's involved in like what's going to change in their workflow? So even uh, schedule optimization, we would need whoever is doing the scheduling to really think through what that means to their day to day now versus when they do it with this tool and be kind of part of the team so that they're ready to use it. Otherwise, if you kind of throw it in at the end, you get resistance. But all these things take time. And if you spend too much time on things that could be made easier by a tool or a platform or getting help and collaborating, I think you, uh, you don't get to the, the hard parts, as I say, as quickly. I am now um, going to switch to a slide that absolutely I did not make, but in the spirit of do it the easy way, um, I just told IBM that they have the best life cycle I've seen, so I'm just going to use theirs if it's okay with them. And this reflects their excellent platform. Um, I've used it, IBM Cloud Pack for data, and it really helps um, bring your work and your organization if you can do it. It's, there's other ones out there. This is not the only one, but it's one I've seen work well of uh, connecting this end to end to get models out there and deployed and uh, working in a production environment. So the important takeaway here is to think of these cycles that a data scientist goes through, you know, getting the data, cleaning the data, refining the data, building the model, um, then deploying it through usually what we think about now, you know, an API or, um, you know, and that could be a dashboard, it could be feeding into an EMR system, but that insight deployment, ideally, we want a team that is expert and full-time um, available to develop that application that it's feeding into or maintain um, that interface with the EMR to keep, test it, to really like have a high quality application to feed data back into the system. And then maybe even be got like a team gathering new requirements and um, what's working for users, what's not. Uh, doing some of that support and then pushing that back 
into the data science uh, workflow, which you would be retraining the models, uh, maybe not going and looking for the data again, but it's iterative. And that's something else I want to talk about. So um, yep, appreciate IBM's cycle here. And I normally, and you've probably seen these as a single cycle. And I, I think that is not as helpful. Um, it's important to understand where different teams that go into building um, AI at scale, where they interact. So um, that cycle did not include exactly a, you know, uh, physician data scientist cycle. So that might be a, a third thing for um, IBM to add someday if, if anyone's working with them from the physician side. But I just wanted to talk about and uh, kind of end with a couple, a couple things that I've noticed that work or kind of are risky and don't work when um, working working with data scientists. And these are there's a few caveats. These are not. It depends, right? It always depends. Um, this is assuming that you're not working with data scientists that are absolute experts in your field which some physicians, you may have that opportunity. Um, but usually in a setting where you're thinking about, and this is what I'm kind of focusing on here, an AI application that's going to be deployed and used by uh, physicians all over the world, because you know we want AI out there. And I think this group knows the impact it could have. And we you know heard and, and just saw some of that uh, with Dr. Sharma's presentation. And, if we want to want to get there frequently, you're going to get into this world of like data scientists who come from lots of different fields. Um, so, number one is the right problem, and we need this from physicians. Uh, data scientists, again, they may have some ideas, and that's a good starting point. But obviously, you know that they, they, they don't understand necessarily this clinical situation at all. The science, the understanding the diagnostic methods used today, the problems with those. So the most helpful thing is to come with a problem and come early with that problem and it can be open-ended. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be like perfectly mapped out. And sometimes it's better not to be mapped out of how you're gonna solve that. And if you're a physician who's less experienced in uh, using AI, it's fine to come with a problem like, you know, I wish I could know um, earlier who is going to develop some complication. Because if I could predict that, and that, you know, I could know that in whatever time frame, like a week in advance, let's say, um, that would give me time to go, you know, have some intervention. Whatever that is, that sort of, here's my problem. And if I could have this information sooner, you know, or I could have a probability that, um, this, this lesion is something I should follow up on or, or whatever it may be, then I could do something. That's like a great start for working together. It's risky to come with a method or a prescribed, like go pull this data or go use this model without any context because then you can't work together. And I, I would encourage you to, to try to work with data scientists who, who can understand that context um, and want to work in this way. The other is deployment planning. So if, again, you know, these, even a proof of concept, you want it to be possible to be used in a, in a setting. Um, you want this to impact medicine and improve outcomes. And to do that, it's very important to think about how are you going to deploy this early on? And yes, the algorithm has to be there and it has to be good and, you know, it's exciting to talk about neural networks or random forest or um, gradient boosting, whatever the method may be, but it's really not the most important thing for this interaction that you're gonna have. Really, it needs to be everything from, how is it gonna interface with the EMR system if that's where it's gonna be deployed, for example, to uh, has the team that, that is in charge of that, are, are they ready and if it, if this is successful, like are, are they willing to deploy it? And this deployment planning will also frequently uncover things that maybe got missed with timing. 
So, you know, you, if you're making, if you want to act, let's say a week in advance, you can only use information available to you at that week in advance a time point, or, you know, at the time of the decision, you need the information available. And because you might be training with historic data, that can be a, a little like mistake of, oh, I, you know, we went all this way and got a great model, but now we've realized that one of the pieces of information won't be available to us at the time of decision. So deployment planning. Uh, other little things, this is a surprising one, um, but I think it's probably easiest to solve working with physicians. And as data scientists, you know, this data scientists, some of the smartest, most capable people that they work with are physicians. And that's a great thing. And so I think this one is probably going to be less of an issue once there's a good conversation and understanding of AI. But I'm going to be honest, I hear complaints about data scientists are difficult or nobody knows what they want and they complain about everything that, you know, they're asked to do. And frequently that's kind of the top of the license, so to speak, work where no one involved understands that the thing they're asking for is, again, not what a data scientist sees themselves as doing. And then they get frustrated and, you know, nothing comes of it and no one's happy. So understanding what that data scientist can do and then trying, making sure the use case is really like a good fit is important for everyone. So uh, Karen, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt here. Uh, sure. We're a bit running short okay. on time. Sure. Can, can we uh, wrap up? Cause I we have is, one more speaker after you, sorry. Oh, okay, absolutely. So, and then these are the smaller points, a clinician that understands AI and I think all of you do. And uh, that allows us to get, get you involved early work collaboratively to find the right data and um, be productive. And then the last is just being open to working in different ways, especially if it's a more of a mixed uh, cross-functional team. So give it a try, agile sprints, um, don't be iterative or give that iterative part a try. And um, data is never complete or perfect. And of course you will wait till that point to publish or do anything, but um, just get started early and involve the data scientists early my biggest advice. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> that was very, very insightful, uh, especially sharing your personal experiences. That was wonderful. So um, next up is uh, uh, Seth, Seth Gross. Uh, uh, Seth is uh, also a fantastic guy. He's an advanced endoscopist. He's a, a you know, professor uh, in Department of Medicine at NYU. He's also the Clinical Chief Division of Gastroenterology Hepatology. I know Seth, Seth with uh, working with him from from the American College, uh, working in the same committee. Uh, he he's uh, involved with AI, and GI at multiple levels, including uh, at the uh, you know at the leadership level with the ASGE, along with Dr. Sharma and Dr. Vargo. So I'm very excited for him to spare his time out and come and talk to us uh, exactly as to how are the GI societies gearing up and embracing the role of AI in GI. So thank you so much, Seth. Please uh, go ahead. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, real pleasure to be here this uh, evening. I really enjoyed the first uh, two presentations. So I'm going to share my screen. And does everybody see it? Yes. OK, Perfect. great. So over the next uh, several minutes, uh, I'm going to talk about the role of societies. And, and before I, I talk specifically around what's happening with artificial intelligence, I, th I thought that we should just really discuss how do societies look at technology? Uh, because AI is the, the most recent technology that, that we deal with, and it's the most exciting. Uh, but uh, aside from artificial intelligence, uh, there are new devices that come out uh, such as hemostatic powder for GI bleeding or new procedures that get developed uh, over the last 10 years or so. We've seen the uh, growth of uh, POEM and, uh, and ESD. And, and where do societies fit uh, in moving these technologies and procedures forward? So as we've heard already uh, this evening, and we know in the field of endoscopy, uh, you know, there's significant advancements in both technology and procedures. Uh, but even though something could be very exciting, and even if the data is, um, uh, is very compelling and shows an improvement uh, to what we're currently doing for a particular disease, you know, there are certain constraints that impact the adoption of new technology. 
And, and this will also impact, uh, you know, the growth of artificial intelligence. So what are, what are some of the, the limiting factors? Uh, one thing that often comes up is what's the cost to the patient and will insurance cover it? As we all know, in, insurance companies are very strict in terms of their policies of what they will and will not cover. And even if the, the data is quite good, they often find ways or reasons to say why they may not cover something versus uh, cover something. Uh, physicians, hospitals, and, and those that uh, work at ambulatory surgery centers, you know, have similar concerns. You know, will I get paid? Uh, is it difficult to do? Will it take, take longer? And, and sometimes the, the last two questions are really not the, the barrier. Uh, but it's not so much even if the physician's going to get paid for, for their effort, since there are unlisted procedure codes, but will the facility uh, get paid to offset the cost of the tools and uh, equipment uh, needed to offer these uh, procedures? And this is something that we have to think about, uh, even with uh, artificial intelligence, because right now, uh, we had the first one, as Dr. Sharma mentioned, uh, approved about two weeks ago. Uh, but there's no additional reimbursement for, for usage uh, during colonoscopy. And sure, there are different reasons why uh, we could say that there's certainly an advantage of uh, finding more uh, polyps and adenomas and sesalcerated lesions uh, beyond, you know, of course, our number one priority, which is offering uh, the best patient care and improved patient care. The other thing that's important to remember is that even if something gets FDA clearance, that does not equal coverage. And, and, and people forget about that. You know, we get very excited uh, as physicians, especially those of us that uh, do procedural based specialties like endoscopy, when new devices get approved, whether it's a clip or a stent or new technologies like artificial intelligence, which is really taking our field to the next level, but it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, Medicare and private insurers are going to automatically cover it. You know, there are some circumstances and pathways uh, that could be taken to allow this to happen, but, but oftentimes it's actually just the beginning of the, of the process to ultimately get uh, uh, coverage. And, and so societies actually play a tremendous role uh, in this. Uh, I know the gastroenterology societies specifically do. I'm actually a, a reimbursement advisor uh, for, the, for the ASGE, and we work very close with our, our sister societies in the realm of CPT, which is to get the code, and I deal with the, the RUC side and, and reimbursement to get the RVU value. I actually present uh, the applications uh, and try to defend existing codes and also aim to get values for new codes, uh, like some of the things we're seeing, such as ESD and, and POEM. Uh, so what is required for, for coverage? Uh, or to go down this path of getting a CPT code, which would then lead to an, a value in terms of an RVU value, which gets translated to dollars. Uh, you need good medical. You need good medical evidence. You need uh, uh, level one uh, literature, uh, well-designed studies, and when you have enough of those, which could be a combination of uh, national and international trials, uh, then you start to build that application, and that's a whole different conversation, but it's important to give some, some background. So, so what are the roles of societies when we think of technology and artificial intelligence uh, falls into this category? Uh, one thing we do know about technology is that it, it's great, it improves patient care, it could certainly even you know, improve the procedure from the physician side, you know, making uh, our experience a bit better, uh, but it tends to increase cost. Unfortunately, technology is not free. And so what do the societies need to do? Uh, they have to ensure quality, uh, safety, and that it's good value for dollars spent. I think we could all think about some technologies over the last 10 or 15 years that we were very, very excited about. And for one reason or another, you know, it's somewhat uh, fizzled. Uh, and it could be that it didn't add much to the current standard of care. It could have been that uh, the, the science uh, wasn't there uh, and uh, they just sort of uh, dis disappear. But this is an important role for societies uh, in terms of their role in uh, helping taking technology and advancements like artificial intelligence and getting it to the end user, which are the physicians that are in practice doing the procedures. 
And so it's important to provide evidence to members to support a new treatment device or drug. And, uh, you know, how is the uh, technology uh, being available and is there an evidence base uh, for for what's uh, what's happening? Because that is critical uh, to get adoption and to get uh, market penetration. Uh, physicians really want to show, uh, or to be seen rather, that there's good medical evidence. You know, maybe 20 years ago, you just needed one study with a small number of patients, and maybe it wasn't well designed, and uh, it will get it, it will get adopted, and uh, physicians would, uh, you know, would start implementing that into their practice. But I could tell you, in 2021, the bar is significantly higher in terms of the level of evidence physicians expect before they make a major practice change. So the societies could play a key role in giving guidance for the development of the evidence. And I think that's why it's really important for industry, especially artificial intelligence uh, companies, you know, to talk with societies, to give them guidance because it's gonna really be important down the road. Uh, so prospective is better than retrospective. Randomized is better than non-randomized. Blinded trials are better than, than, than unblinded trials or just more powerful. And these are things that, that we all know. Uh, and some companies and technologies will go the extra mile to, to offer high quality trials and others uh, will try to um, cut corners and, and not offer that level of evidence. And we've seen successful uh, companies uh, that have been able to do this, uh, such as radio frequency ablation for Barrett's esophagus. And then we've seen other technologies uh, that were, that came out around the same time that were, were quite good and, and very encouraging, but the, the level of evidence uh, was, was, was not uh, achieved. They did not perform the trials that were necessary. And instead of being a first line therapy, you know, they tend to be a rescue therapy or, or they just sort of fade away for, from that disease state. So what about artificial intelligence in societies? You know, a great example is the ASGE, which uh, many of you are familiar with, and, and, and Dr. Sharma is a, a key leader in this. Uh, they took the approach of identifying physicians that have an expertise in artificial intelligence, and then they went on to have a, a task force, uh, which uh, uh, Dr. Sharma actually oversees. And, and that's really important. It shows a commitment, and it also shows uh, to the technology that the, you know, the ASGE and of course, you know, the other societies recognize that artificial intelligence has a tremendous potential uh, to help the physician and of course, uh, to help our, our patients. So the task force uh, created uh, a document of, of what is, uh, what are the priorities? And this is just some examples from that uh, document over the next slide or two, uh, which is priority use cases such as computer vision application, decision support, what are the data science uh, priorities, uh, video libraries like Ender, Endonet, uh, standardizing the methods of uh, storing and sharing and labeling endoscopic videos to having some consistency, and what are some of the research uh, priorities, which is validating these computer vision tools. Uh, because there is going to be a standard that uh, endoscopists are going to expect, you know, if you think about uh, scopes and scope processors, uh, we have different companies that offer them, but we have standards. You know, for instance, uh, we expect that when we use a gastroscope or a colonoscope, that there's going to be high definition, and and a task force like this and the involvement of societies could help guide industry in the artificial intelligence space of what those minimum standards we expect uh, when we're using these new technologies. It's also important to identify disease states, which this uh, group also was able to do. And you heard uh, in a talk earlier about colon polyp and detection and diagnosis, and even uh, assessing depth of cancer invasion and colon cancer. Uh, and other pain points, you know, when I think of it is Barrett's esophagus and detecting dysplasia. Even though Barrett's esophagus in many patients is a, a short area over a few centimeters, it can be very difficult to different, differentiate dysplasia in that segment identifying gastric dysplasia or cancer in, in someone that's high risk or, and, and lastly, inflammatory bowel disease, you know, the ability to uh, detect dysplasia. So we're, we're starting in the colon, which makes sense because there are so many colonoscopies done worldwide. Uh, 
And uh, colon cancer is something that is certainly preventable, you know, for those patients that get screened and have uh, surveillance. So it's really important to, to partner with industry where societies could help evaluate the various platforms, give guidance for clinical trials to impact clinical care, ensure safety. And they're also critical uh, to help get reimbursement because again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we need to have some level of, of, of reimbursement in the future. Uh, in the, in where we are right now, I think there's going to be some excitement. There will be a lot of trials. There are going to be some early adapters. But if you really want to impact and change uh, clinical care, uh, you know, one of the things we do have to think about is, is reimbursement. Uh, there was a, uh, a summit uh, two years in a row uh, sponsored by the ASGE. And this was uh, led by uh, Dr. Sharma. And this is an AI summit. So another important role of societies is offering education because that's how we're gonna be able to educate our colleagues in terms of where artificial intelligence is today and where it's, uh, where it's going. Uh, this occurred in 2019 and, and this past year, uh, 2020, it was virtual. You know, what does it allow us to do? It fosters discussion. It allows physicians to see what's available and how would this be put into your clinical practice? And, we, and there was a whole range of stakeholders there, which was really important. So we had physicians, we had industry, uh, we had developers, we had entrepreneurs, you know, we, we had people from uh, Google and, and Microsoft, uh, we had regulatory experts from the FDA, all sort of weighing in in a field that really is at its infancy. And, and it was a tremendous step forward a couple of weeks ago, having the first system FDA approved. Uh, and I think we're just going to even see more, you know, in five years, this space is going to look completely uh, different. So to conclude, societies are truly the, the connection or linchpin between industry, physician end users and uh, payers. And so societies are really important in making sure that uh, there are good guidelines uh, based on strong scientific evidence and the opinions of experts and, and societies play a key role in all of this. Uh, thank you for your time, and I'm happy to take any questions, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Seth. That, that was fantastic. That was exactly what we wanted to see, and we are so excited that the GI leadership is, is looking forward to it. Um, I, I think Dr. Sharma might have left because he had a meeting to go. So, uh, Seth, if you don't mind, I'm going to field a couple of questions that probably were for him, but I'm pretty sure you are well-versed with them. Uh, one was uh, it came from one of our uh, you know listeners uh, in regards to the role of AI. So are there you know we we definitely knew from Dr. Sharma's presentation there are a lot of models there to polyp detection, uh, to you know assess the bowel prep. But are there any models that predict whether the bowel prep will be adequate or not? Meaning beforehand, can we use AI to predict which patients will have a good bowel prep versus not? Yeah, so, so, so right now the, the, the work for colonoscopy, for instance, is really intra-procedure. And so there are some platforms uh, where I've seen that uh, you're in, say, the cecum and uh, the AI system is able to uh, grade the Boston bowel prep. And if, they, if there's a lot of uh, residue on the wall, it'll start off at uh, you know, a, a one. And then as you wash, it'll transition to a two or three. I think you bring up a, a bigger point and there's certainly value for artificial intelligence uh, in, in this role too, is you know, how do you predict patients uh, you know, if they're going to have an adequate bowel prep, uh, you know, or should you have a different bowel prep approach for them, right? You know, should they have a two-day prep versus just the standard prep? Uh, and and I, I'm not aware of any uh, programs looking at that right now, but I could tell you uh, that Lauren Lane had published something about GI bleeding and how artificial intelligence using just uh, clinical uh, data uh, inputs uh, from electronic medical record actually did a better job than the bleeding uh, scores that uh, we use in terms of risk stratifying who will need to be admitted and who, who will need to uh, get sent home. So, so I think we'll see that. Um, I don't think it's a focus right now, right? I think right now the, the big focus is intra-procedure with lesion, lesion detection and interpretation. Perfect. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's 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 wonderful. Uh, one thing that I had I, I had a question because you know, as uh, you you are aware, uh, recently FDA did approve the first Medtronic device uh, for AI for polyp detection, and and you are yourself a you know uh, uh, chief of your division for the clinical operations. 
how do you see we integrate that into our practice? Because the reason I ask is uh, people like yourself and myself, we would love something like this. But then we all have physicians, you know, in our practices or groups who are like, oh, this is machine replacing man. No, we, we don't want this in our endo centers. So how do you think that getting part of our, becoming a part of our practice? Well, so, so I, you know, I, I don't, uh, you know, necessarily look at it that uh, we're going to be replaced, right? I, you know, I don't think we're, we're there. I don't think it's going to be what's happening with radiology where chest x-rays are going to be interpreted initially by an AI uh, software program. And then you'll have a radiologist uh, having to, you know, be the tiebreaker, you know, when there's an abnormal finding. Uh, you know, you have to think of artificial intelligence uh, within colonoscopy or, or lesion detection in the lumen, sort of similar when you have your nurse with you uh, that will say, what about this? What about that? What do you think about this? Uh, but, you know, doing this at a much, much, much uh, higher level, uh, sort of like, um, you, you know, the backseat driver, which, you know, you may find frustrating when you're, when you're with your family or friend, when you're going somewhere and they think they know better, but in this instance, it potentially could, uh, you know, could, could help you. Uh, so, so I don't, I don't think it's going to be, I don't think that's going to be the barrier, right? I, I think that if you took, uh, put gastroenterologists in a room and you presented them artificial intelligence and you said to them, would you use this tomorrow? And you know, what's the barrier? And I think it's not going to be a time barrier, right? Uh, it's going to be, uh, you know, a cost area. And, you know, will artificial intelligence be similar to narrowband imaging where one day it was not there and the next day we got new scopes and wow, they put it in there. We didn't even ask for it. Uh, so will it be a standard feature like when you buy a car today, uh, maybe 10 years ago, navigation was extra, but now they just give it to you because, uh, you know, it, it just got less expensive. So, so we'll have to see, but it's not going to replace us. Uh, that, that's for sure. It's just potentially going to help uh, physicians. Yeah, no, I think that's a that's a great analogy of the car navigation system. I think that's how we probably have to approach it. Um, I think one question I, I have for you, Karen, um, uh, in in your assessment, because you have worked with one very big healthcare system. Uh, in your assessment, do you think healthcare systems have resources to manage the AI tools once they are deployed? Like, are the healthcare systems ready for this? That's a great question, um, and 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 can be a, a big problem. And that that's that deployment planning. So part of it, you can improve, and I think that gets to some of the platforms that make it easier to monitor the models when they're out there. They make it easier to integrate um, in a standard way, so you don't need a lot of like customization and constant, you know, hands-on maintenance of whatever's been built. So that, that's one way from the technology perspective, but maintaining it is also um, knowing how to use it effectively and train you know, new, new people who are coming in, how, how to use it and integrate it into their decision-making or workflow. And, and that's another aspect that healthcare systems probably vary in, in their readiness to do that, but it's an area that we're probably going to have to focus on and, and get better at if we, if we really want to see AI succeed in medicine broadly. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, one other quick question, Karen, if you can take this, it's, a, it's essentially from me. So, you know, whenever we traditionally, we physicians do a research, we are always calculating the sample size, the sample size. Uh, is there a good percentage if I have an AI idea? So like we, we know we need the test set and then there is a validation set. Is there a percentage, like you have to have a 50-50 percentage for the test sample and the validation sample, or it's, it's just any any number or more is better? Like, is, is there a good good way to gauge that? That's a really good question. And, and I would I would say as a as a guideline, there, you know, there there can be ways. Usually data science is um, we're dealing with data that's imperfect, like I said, and messy. So we're, we're used to, there are many techniques to deal with um, highly dimensional data. So you have a lot of like variables, but not a lot of samples. And, um, you know, we, we know how to deal with that. I would start with, here's all the data that could be available and let the data scientist decide how they want to balance that. So a 50-50 split is an ideal. I have yet to see a situation that has actually been that. I, I think the best I've seen is maybe 15 to 20% of you know, the event of interest. And that's really good. 
um, the first model I built, I was dealing with 1% and there are methods and ways to, to, uh, to handle that. Thank you so much. I think uh, in interest of time, um, I really want to thank all the speakers. Thank you so much. It was fantastic. I learned a lot and I'm sure our BrainX community would love it. Uh, it, it, it will be available for them to uh, see it as well. Uh, with that, I'd also like to thank Piyush for you know, giving GI this space. Uh, you know, I know uh, BrainX is in so much demand, so, but you took special time for GI out. Uh, thank you so much for that. And with that, I'll hand it over back to you. Thank you, Piyush. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Gursimran. Uh, I, I think this was a great session. I learned, as you said, I learned a lot. And it was special because uh, you know, we started with uh, the clinical perspective, then we built upon the data science perspective and you know, Seth came at the end uh, talking about you know, how do you make all this work? So it, it was great to see an end-to-end -end, uh, complete colonoscopy in many ways uh, and, and well done. So that, that was a, a great learning point. I think the, the Talal had a great question too about uh, applications of AI and EHR, and a lot of those are evolving. If you heard recently in the news, Talal, uh, you know, uh, Nuance uh, was, uh, is being bought over by Microsoft, and that, again, is an AI company, and the integration of that into the, into the uh, EHR in many ways is well known. Uh, so I think there are a lot of, there's a lot of work going on over there to help us with the EHR burnout. Again, uh, I thank all the, the speakers. I thank uh, Dr. Kocher for this wonderful uh, session. Uh, some of the, uh, the areas uh, that we can focus on and uh, develop further, GI is leading in, so great work there. And for BrainX community, the web page, the LinkedIn group, uh, there are all these different content uh, mediums. Please join us, uh, please share these. And through sharing and collaborating only, we'll grow better. So with that, I'm going to close out today's session. Thank you very much once again.